next on NH1 News at 5.30. Republican Scott Brown urges his opponent, Democrat Gene Shaheen, to back his plan to punish Americans fighting with ISIS. Skateboarders from the United States and beyond take on each other here in Antrim. I'm Tyler Dumont with a story coming up. Good evening, New Hampshire, and thanks for joining us tonight at 5.30. I'm Paul Mueller. And I'm Sherry Small. Hello. A challenge from Republican Scott Brown to Democratic incumbent Gene Shaheen in the U.S. Senate race. Brown sending Shaheen a letter today urging the senator, the senator not to come home from Washington until the southern border is more secure and homegrown terrorists are contained. NH1 political director Paul Steinhauser now with the details. In his letter... Brown asked Shaheen to support a bill he once proposed that would strip U.S. citizenship from Americans who fight along ISIS. I talked to the senator this weekend, and I asked her about Brown's proposal. Clearly, anyone who fights with ISIS is a tra traitor, and they should lose their citizenship. So I do think we need to take strong action. As for beefing up border security, the senator's campaign says Shaheen urges Brown to call on House Speaker John Boehner to allow a vote on a bipartisan bill passed by the Senate last year. Now, that measure would double the number of border agents along the U.S. border with Mexico. All right, Paul, thank you very much. Meantime, Governor Maggie Hassan winning her first veto fight with the legislature today. The Republican-led Senate wanted a bill to beef up management at the Sununu Youth Center that's in Concord. In her veto, Hassan charged the bill placed too much of the focus on incarceration rather than on treatment at a Manchester residence for juvenile offenders. Now, coming up on NH1 News at 6, we will hear from both parties on the Senate showdown. And for more on other stories making headlines right now, we turn to our own Kiki Benzel live here in the studio. Kiki, lots going on. It certainly is, Paul. Thanks a lot. Chris Christie is coming back to New Hampshire this week. The GOP governor from New Jersey will be in our state on Wednesday in his role as chairman of the Republican Governors Association. Christie will campaign with Republican gubernatorial nominee Walt Havenstein in Nashua. Now, later in the day, Christie teams up in Salem with Scott Brown, the GOP Senate nominee. And the wildest trip is mostly about 2014. It could pay off down the road if Christie does decide to run for president. This will be Christie's third trip to New Hampshire this year, which of course holds the first primary in the race for the White House. He also made a stop this summer in Iowa, which kicks off the primary and caucus calendar. Now the big question for us, when will Hillary Clinton pay a visit to the Granite State? That's coming up on NH1 News at 6 o'clock. A registered sex offender who stole a Nashua couple's car with a child in the back seat has been charged with kidnapping. Police say the parents knew Victor Baez and asked him to look after the child while they were in a Wuborn court. But when the, they came out, apparently he was gone. The baby was found safe in the car about 45 minutes later. Maez is facing several charges. Dover police are asking for the public's help in identifying a suspect in nearly 20 car thefts in the past two weeks. They say some of them have happened in the area of Silver Street, 4th Street and Grove Street. Anyone with information should call the Dover police. And a very sad day for the Exeter High community. 17-year-old Emma Jacobs of East Kingston was laid to rest earlier today. The lacrosse player was killed in a car accident last Wednesday. Another car hit her while driving on Hall Farm Road in Atkinson. Sherry. All right, thank you very much, Kiki. Eroding beaches, declining real estate values, ocean front homes collapsing. These are some of the issues the seacoast is facing over the next century with climate change and rising sea levels. At an environmental forum this morning, Portsmouth Mayor Robert Lister spoke with members of the state's League of Conservation voters, local business owners, and residents about the impending threat, a threat many are just not aware of. It really affects, in the future, affects the uh, economy, uh, real estate values, the whole community in Portsmouth, and I think people should really know about this. That's a big problem here in Portsmouth, and I know this is going to be dramatically increased over time, and people are going to have to look at the issues then. The mayor will travel to Washington, D.C. on Thursday to be part of a national discussion about the rising sea level issue. All right, time to uh, let's check in on the weather quickly. Let's send it on over to Clayton Striver for a preview.
Hey, Clayton. Sherry, and uh, good evening, everybody. Hey, we're talking some warmer overnight lows here, folks. If you had the heat running full force last night, uh, we had a lot of spots in the 30s for lows. Not going to be the case this night, and there's a good reason for it. We're tracking a cold front moving in that will eventually increase the clouds, and I think well past the midnight hours, some light rain showers rolling in. But, uh, yeah, you can see the projected overnight lows here across the region, generally mid to upper 40s, even the seacoast a tad warmer there thanks to the water. Keeps temps up a little bit, I think, low 50 for you there. So let's walk you through it hour by hour for Concord here as we go into the evening hours. Temperatures cooling back into the 50s. Here we are at 8 o'clock. Still a mainly clear sky as we get close to that midnight hour. Temperatures do look to cool back into the 40s. We're still on the clear side yet, but Things start to change a little bit for our Tuesday. We can see temperatures dropping down into the 40s for first thing in the morning here. But yes, prepare for some rain showers for your morning commute here. Uh, they look to be generally on the light side, nothing too terribly heavy. I think that rain shower chance probably goes up until about the noon hour or maybe a little bit after that. At that point, though, expecting some clearing sky here. So yeah, I think by later in the afternoon, we're talking a fair amount of sunshine, and that should allow those temperatures to climb well back up into the 60s. So your forecast then for tonight and for tomorrow, we're calling it lows in the 40s generally, those morning rain showers. You can see the chance, the percentage chance in the morning at 60%, but it drops down to 30% by the noon hour as we start to see the skies clear out. And yeah, ample sunshine overall here as we get later into the afternoon. It looks like the rest of the week will feature some pretty nice weather for outdoor activities, although temperatures remain a little bit below seasonable for this time of the year. I'll let you know if there'll be any warm up maybe for the weekend. Stick around. Paul. We hope so. All right, Clayton, thank you very much. Thousands of people in Antrim over the weekend for the annual Fall Festival. But there's one event that draws talent and technique from all across the world. And it's one's Tyler Dumont now explains. for that fourth beat. It's about precision and staying focused. There's some speed to it. Um, you know, it looks an awful lot like uh, downhill skiing slalom. It looks a lot like snowboarding uh, and that kind of thing. The big hill isn't usually a racing course. It comes down to cones. That is until the Can-Am Slalom Skateboarding Contest at the town's annual Winhars Festival. This track is intense. It's over 700 feet long and skateboarders reach speeds over 30 miles per hour. The contest brings skateboard experts from sporters together in New Hampshire. I'm from Quebec City and we come here because um, we don't have a lot of race and this organization is super good. The hill is super fun and uh, people are awesome. <laughs> Louis Ricard has to travel to races around the world. And like at Texas, California, uh, Spain. It's because not too many communities offer this type of experience. Local Dave Kirkpatrick has been organizing the race for the past couple of years. All the folks who started it up uh, wandered off, and I was the guy doing it in town now. I'm the, you know, the new guy on the scene. And the scene is loaded with energy. After all, it's all about technique. You notice uh, when you're watching the races at the end, you can see people kind of waving their arms back and forth almost around each cone, and that's called pumping. Organizers say that today's event was a huge success, brings a lot of people together, and they're just happy that they get to keep on racing. And Antrim, Tyler Dumont, NH1 News. All right, now we have a traffic alert we want to pass along tonight. A section of Route 63 along Spofford Lake in Chesterfield is under construction. So from now until mid-November, there will be one-way traffic from 7 in the morning to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. So if that's part of your travel, you may want to find an alternate route. Meantime, after several barbaric killings, Global is now ripping off their efforts to take on ISIS. That's right, the terror group killed freelance journalist James Foley of Rochester. Now, some shocking information about where the militants have been getting the money and support. Plus, President Obama awarding the nation's highest military honor to three servicemen. How one man gave his life during a heroic stand in the Civil War. And H1 News at 530 is back right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Secretary of State John Kerry is on the road building a coalition to fight ISIS militants. It's all part of the president's plan to dismantle, then destroy the terror group, which has taken over parts of Iraq and Syria. Mary Maloney looks at who's on board and who isn't. 
In Paris, a fragile coalition appears to be taking shape against ISIS. So far, about 40 nations have agreed to take on at least a limited role in the fight against the militant group. Among them is France, which has begun surveillance flights over Iraq. This terrorist movement pretends founding a state. Such as the threat, it is a global one, and there must be a global response. But perhaps even more telling are the Middle East countries who have expressed a willingness to get involved as ISIS runs rampant across Syria and Iraq. The threat posed by ISIS is so unprecedented that it's not at all certain anyone knows how to deal with it. We can transfer weapons, we can train, but we cannot really transfer political will. And at the heart of any war is the need for those governments on the ground to have political will to resist. Secretary of State John Kerry insists this is not a rush to war. One military analyst agrees it's something totally different. This is us trying to get other countries to fight the war for us. We're, we're, we're willing to provide the air power, we're willing to provide the logistics, the intelligence, even some funding, but we want other people to send their troops. The urgency to do something was greatly ramped up over the weekend when ISIS beheaded a third Westerner, British aid worker David Haynes. ISIS is believed to be holding several other prisoners from the U.S. and other countries. In Atlanta, I'm Mary Maloney reporting. And now here's a shocking detail about how Islamic State militants get their funding. The extremist group that once relied on wealthy Persian Gulf donors for money is now earning more than $3 million a day. They do this through oil smuggling, human trafficking, theft and extortion. That's according to U.S. intelligence officials and private experts. American intelligence officials say the group's resources exceed that of any other terrorist organization in history. Mexico's Baja Peninsula has been taking a pounding from Hurricane Odile. At luxury resorts, the facades have been ripped away and also countless car and hotel windows have been shattered. Some of the hotel lobbies have even been left swamped and full of debris. The storm made landfall last night near Cabo San Lucas as a powerful Category 3 hurricane. Its top winds topped near 110 miles an hour as it moved over the peninsula. Nearly half a century after their acts of valor, a grateful nation bestows upon these men the highest military decoration. The president there speaking about Army Command Sergeant Major Benny Atkins and Army Specialist Donald Sloat. The two men receiving the nation's highest military honor for their actions while serving in Vietnam. Adkins, seen here, served as an intelligence officer. He repeatedly ran through enemy fire to pull injured comrades to safety when his camp was attacked and Sloat gave up his life, throwing himself on a grenade to save his fellow troops. And President Obama also approving the awarding of the Medal of Honor to First Lieutenant Alonzo Cushing for his action at the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. He is the man in the center in the back row. In the crucial Battle of Gettysburg, the 22-year-old lieutenant's unit was nearly wiped out by Confederate artillery. That ceremony will take place at a later date. All right, now let's take a look at the weather. You know what? If we haven't been keeping track of the calendar, we knew it by the temperatures this yes. morning. Fall is definitely here. A little Clayton. bit of a wake-up call. September 22nd, I think it is, is when it officially uh, kicks off. But uh, of course, oh, we got so a little bit of a. Oh, so I'm ahead of myself a little yeah, bit Yeah, I mean, here. we're, we're well, starting to feel like that way. Well, it felt like it was here. Exactly. We had the frost this morning as well, but it won't be as cold tonight, Sherry. That's because we're tracking some rain showers here and a cold front that are moving in. That's going to increase the cloud cover. That will make for some warmer overnight lows. And here we go for our Tuesday now. I think there will be some showers mainly during the morning hours. So it will be a little wet for the morning commute. If you have the kids out at the bus stop, make sure they have the raincoats. You'll need the umbrellas. Uh, temperatures in the afternoon, though, climb up into the 60s. I expect clearing sky as we get past that noon hour here. So things should feel fairly comfortable overall, and it shouldn't be too terribly breezy for us. Let's walk you through golfing wise. If you're getting a little bit of the uh, last few swings in, perhaps if you don't like to golf in the colder weather, uh, we'll call tomorrow good for golfing weather. And that's because, of course, when we get the clearing sky in the afternoon, the sunshine, a light breeze, 
not too bad to get some swings in here. And then Wednesday, notice how the levels continue to climb here into Thursday for our golfing weather. Yeah, we're back to excellent conditions for golf now on Thursday as things get a little bit warmer. We have the light winds and we continue to see a lot of sunshine to enjoy. Now, if you deal with aches and pains, we do see that quite a bit when we have these fronts come in here. Arthritis, Paul knows about this. He's always chatting with me. <laughs> Here we go for our Tuesday. The level's at neutral, so it's not too terribly bad, Paul. And for the rest of you at home, if you deal with those aches and pains with a front, at least the level's not too terribly high. And here's the good news. We're right back to beneficial conditions as we go into our Wednesday and Thursday when we get the high-pressure stone, the cooler, drier, more pleasant air mass to uh, settle back in. Hey, Portsmouth, your planner for Tuesday. Some of those morning rain showers here, 52 degrees. By the noon hour, I still think we hang on to a shower chance for the seacoast locations fairly cloudy. Cloudy, but by 5 o'clock, we're enjoying mostly sunny sky in the 60s and by 11 o'clock at night, clear sky and temperatures dipping back into the 50s. Let's take a look at that all important seven day forecast. Could have some early morning fog on our Tuesday to go along with those showers, but the clearing sky in the afternoon. Wednesday, sunny sky, 68 degrees. Notice that morning low of 46. Here we go on Thursday now, though sunshine 64, but yeah, we could be talking some of that frost again Thursday night, early Friday with lows back into the 30s. Friday, a high of 62, but a lot of sunshine. And again, Friday night, Saturday morning, some lows in the 30s with frost possible. If you have any plants, of course, agricultural uh, purposes there, you want to be paying close attention to the weather with that forecast. And then Saturday, 68 and sunny, and we're back in the 70s by Sunday, but another cold front after Sunday will cool things back off. Cherry Paul. All right, thank you, Clayton. So you feeling that cold in your joints a little? Always giving me, <laughs> you know, a hard time about my arthritis, Clayton. I'm telling you. All right. All right, just ahead on NH1 News at 5.30, a recall you need to know about the complaints about one very popular car. Plus, the new iPhone from Apple. It is so popular, it's breaking records with pre-sale orders. But what if you didn't pre-order, Jerry, Kiki? What are some stores in New Hampshire are saying about whether they will have it when it's released on Friday? We are back on the other side of the break. Well, it's a bad day for those looking to get their hands on the new iPhone 6. Its pre-sale orders have already broken records. Apple says it has taken 4 million pre-orders for the iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus. And if you try to get on the website, you may have had to deal with long delays or maybe you couldn't even get on. Now, phones will be available Friday at Apple retail stores and wireless carriers, but if you were hoping to get an iPhone 6 Plus, uh, sorry to tell you, probably not going to happen. Pre-orders sold out within hours. Here in New Hampshire, stores say they were bombarded with pre-orders, but are not sure if they will have any on the shelves come Friday. Thanks for that heads up. All right, more consumer news right now. If you're driving a Ford, listen up. U.S. safety regulators are getting a whole lot of complaints about the Ford Fiesta. So what is wrong with the car? Well, its doors won't latch properly on the 2011 through 2013 models. Now, out of the more than 60 complaints, a dozen drivers saying a door opened while the car's or being driven. If you own one, of course, you're urged to contact your Ford dealer. Meantime, General Motors now tied to nearly 20 wrongful deaths. In a report released just today, families of those who died are eligible for compensation. An attorney hired by GM has received more than 100 claims due to faulty switches in older model small cars like the Chevy Cobalt. The switches can slip out of the run position, causing engines to stall. GM recalled 2.6 million cars this year, but engineers knew about the problem, they say, 10 years ago. All right, some students in New Hampshire have a living experience that's, well, you could call it decidedly different. You can say that again. We didn't have this. Up next on NH1 News at 6, the college where groups can design their own communities. What? Pretty you cool. You see that. That is just ahead on the other side of the break. <laughs> Dorm room living, well, it's part of the college experience, but you know what, Paul? It's changed a lot since we've been in school. I was lucky to have a bed when I went to school. <laughs> Get this. At Dartmouth College, they have 10 design your own communities. That's right, how it works. A group of students submit theme ideas for certain suites. A suite? All right. Some of the results, ethical and plant-based eating is the focus on the new herbifloor, while the Harry Potter area is called Muggles for Magical 
awareness. All right. What a way to go to school these days. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, on right. the floor or on a bed in a little tiny fridge like this, and we were happy. Did you ever design, you know, a couch or a chair out of pizza boxes? <laughs> no. like, that's creative. Never did that. I never that's did that. I always we'll wanted to. We'll keep some things on the down <laughs> You low, weren't an right? engineering student, that's apparently. Probably, no, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. <laughs> right. But, uh, hey, let's talk weather-wise, because we do have some rain showers eventually coming in here, folks. But... Not so much tonight yet here as we go hour by hour for Concord. I think this will be very similar across the region here. Uh, temperatures with time tonight will be cooling back into the uh, low 50s and upper 40s. You can see here we are at 9 o'clock, still mainly clear sky getting down into the 40s in some locations as we get past that midnight hour. Overnight lows generally in the 40s to around 50, so not quite as chilly as uh, last night there. But yeah, as we get up to a sunrise here, here we are 6 a.m. We'll have some of these light rain showers coming in here. Cloudy skies will make for some cool conditions, a little damp out there. I think a tenth to a quarter of inch of total rainfall, but if you like sunshine and better weather, as we go into the afternoon hours, it looks like the skies clear out and temperatures will be going back up into the 60s. And you can see at the bottom of your screen there, looks like a lot of sunshine for a pretty extended period as temperatures I expect will remain in the 60s for highs. But by Monday, we could have a few rain showers back in the mix. Those right. overnight temperatures, chilly. Yes, they were, but at least the next few nights now, not quite as chilly, and that's yeah. better for agricultural purposes, too. All right, Clayton, thank you. Kiki yeah. joins me for the news at 6. We're back after this. Good night.